Well, sir, Mr. Art 101 with Mr. Berger, congratulations to you on being such a wonderful and prolific art teacher and historian. And thank you for teaching, first of all, and thank you for sharing your gifts. But most especially right now, look, I had to wear this because you are doing uh, a video on 80s artists. And uh, of course, Jean-Michel Basquiat is uh, one of our treasures and he hails from my home state, New York. And so I uh, just wanted to say congratulations to you for all that you've done and all of your work, but I really appreciate what you're doing in the art world and utilizing your platform on YouTube uh, to share the gift of art and the artist behind the art. Thanks. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Berger. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. I appreciate that very much. And scholars, welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger, a professional artist and educator attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. If you like this one, please interact with it. I appreciate it greatly. In this lifetime, you don't have to prove nothing to nobody except yourself. February is Black History Month, and one of the African-American artists that has really had an impact on me and my uh, art making is a New York native African-American artist who really is, is a little bit misunderstood. And uh, so I'd like to clear the air a little bit on a very influential artist, Jean-Michel Basquiat. For any artist to become mainstream is really an uphill battle. One unlikely artist to go mainstream was Jean-Michel Basquiat. He was an American artist of Haitian and Puerto Rican descent. He would begin his art exploits on the Lower East Side of Manhattan as a graffiti artist. Celebration of local graffiti artists? Jean-Michel was the second of four children, and his mother would very much instill in him a love and passion for creation and the visual arts. At a relatively young age, his parents would separate, and he would spend a lot of those early years living with his mother. However, it was determined that she was unable to take care of him properly, and he was put into the custody of his father. When Jean-Michel was just 10 years old, his mother was put into a mental institution where she would spend really the remainder of her life in and out of the institutional system. He went from a conventional public school into a school that was geared more toward the unconventional artist types, and then he ended up deciding at the age of 17, he was done with this formal education business. Brain damage! He's got brain damage and doesn't even know it! Using the alter ego Samo, Basquiat would first get involved with graffiti art after deciding to leave school at the age of 17. Simultaneously, his father said, if you're not going to go to school, you're not living in my house, so he left. And he found himself living on the streets. In the late 70s, early rap, punk, and street graffiti art were really melting down into what would become hip-hop, music, culture, identity, life. He goes from 1978 being a kid on the streets with a rattle can and one year later appearing on a public access television show talking about his work. Tonight we're lucky enough to have with us uh, probably the most language oriented of all graffiti artists in New York, Samo and his associate. Samo, right? sorry. It's Mr. Samo. It's my At the same time he's working on making music with a group that would be called Grey. So he's living in the East Village and spray painting by night, trying to make money by day, and pursuing a music dream all at the same time. I didn't know that. He was also making little artworks and trying to sell them on the streets for cash, and so the story goes, one day he spots Andy Warhol, where he and an art critic are going in to have some lunch. Now, according to the big budget movie that's about Basquiat's life, he would go in and sell Andy Warhol postcards, and in some fashion really get discovered in that moment of imposing himself on their meal. 
Some have claimed that that's not exactly how it happened, but who's to say? It seems as reasonable a story as any other, so we'll just go with that. In 1980, Jean-Michel decided that it was time to end the Samo alter ego, and so he would go around spray painting Samo is dead. And Jean-Michel Basquiat starts to go mainstream as a gallery artist. His work was largely responsible for elevating graffiti artists into the realm of New York gallery quality. His spray-painted clowns and scribbles, pop culture icons and Bible verses migrated from the street onto the gallery walls. Shit. By the early 1980s, they were starting to call him a neo-expressionist and was showing his work in art galleries and museums internationally. In his early 20s, he was gaining international notoriety and popularity that has been unseen or unmatched since he passed in 1988. He was definitely a product of the 1980s. I mean, for crying out loud, he dated Madonna. He had his first solo show in 1981 where he would make $200,000 for that event. For many of the projects in the show, he would use cultural icons in the work. Sugar Ray Robinson, Muhammad Ali, Dizzy Gillespie, and others. Now he's not trying to make a lifelike representation, he's trying to capture the essence of who he thinks this individual is. I think there's a lot of people that are, that are, that are neglected in, in, in art. I don't know if, because if, it's, if it's who made the paintings or what. But, um... I know, it's, I know black people are never really portrayed realistically in... Not, 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 or not even portrayed, I mean, not even portrayed in modern art enough. You damn right! Basquiat's focus of art was really an internal dialogue put into a graffiti art external framework. He would have commentary on wealth, segregation, internal and external experiences, and much, much more. And I would say, like most artists, he wasn't just interested in one aspect or facet of art. He was interested in poetry, drawing, music, language, painting, history, and beyond. And, and so, and you're you're seen as as some sort of uh, primal expressionism. Is that? I mean, like an ape. Well, uh, let, let's a, a primate. Well. I don't know. Is that, is that you said it. I don't know. You said it. He was on edge. He was defensive. He had no choice but to think that every single time he was asked a question, it was going to come back to downgrade or make him look silly. I had this a lot. This, 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 most of my reviews have been more reviews on, on, of your on, personality. on my personality, yeah, more so than, than my work mostly. How, so how do, you re- how do you react to that sort of thing? They're just racist, most of these people. Yeah, this image of me, you know, wild man running, you know, wild monkey man, whatever the, whatever the f*** they think. That's why homie don't play that. Side note, at the height of his popularity, Jean-Michel Basquiat would purchase high-end suits, not to wear around or to go to events, but to wear while painting his work. He really got a kick out of taking these high-end garments and destroying them in the studio as he worked. I'd knock that shit off if I was you. Every artist starts somewhere in terms of pricing their artworks, and Jean-Michel starts kind of in the basement selling his first major work, Cadillac Moon, created in 1981 to singer Debbie Harry, who is best known as the front woman of the rock band Blondie. He would sell that to her for only $200. His work has steadily increased in value, which is exactly what you want to have, especially for the people that are investing in the work. In 2017, a work untitled sold for $110.5 million, creating a new record high for an American artist selling at auction. This is ridiculous. Basquiat and Andy Warhol would meet again in October of 1982. And truth be told, they had a very genuine friendship for quite a long time until that soured over time, but we'll get to that in a moment. Over the years, and predominantly in 84 and 85, there was quite a collaboration between Warhol and Basquiat. 
They did work for the Los Angeles Summer of the Olympics in 84. They did several collaborative paintings together as well as joint exhibitions. Things started to go a little bit south when they started to see Basquiat as the tag-along with Andy Warhol as to them being equals. And so that really put a tarnish on the relationship. But it's very fair to say that Basquiat was a sensitive guy. He was an emotionally unstable individual that was haunted by drug use, particularly cocaine and heroin. After his passing, some friends would say that he would use heroin as a coping mechanism to the demands of his newfound fame. Others thought it was because he was a black man in a white-dominated world. Side note, he is a sad statistical member of the 27 Club, a list of mostly musicians but also artists and actors who achieved great popularity and success in life but would pass away sadly at the age of 27. The list also would include Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, and more recently Amy Winehouse. The exhibition with Basquiat and Andy Warhol was legendary. But after severing ties with Andy Warhol, he became a bit of a recluse. And after Andy Warhol's death in 1987, he was very much heartbroken over the fact that he was not able to mend that relationship with him, and at the same time, still harboring some ill wills. And so he was very conflicted about his feelings about the death of Andy Warhol. And man, I ain't been right ever since then. And this would send him into a deep downward spiral. Despite rehab and attempts to get sober, Basquiat would die of a heroin overdose in his studio in Manhattan on August the 12th, 1988. Now what do I know? I color for a living, but that is a roller coaster of a story, and I appreciate you for watching it. Have a great day.